Okay. Um, hey, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Matthias. Um, I work with uh, Jamie on the Android team at SoundCloud. Um, yeah, I know it's like kind of late in the afternoon, so um, I'm, I'm hope you're going to um, stay awake through this talk. I'll, I'll do my best to not uh, put you to sleep. Um, I'm going to speak today about um, concurrency on Android, and I would say like at a rather like um, non-standard way of looking at it and dealing with concurrency on Android. And um, yeah, um, I, I would probably summarize it as um, it, it's basically this talk is going to be about a practice called functional reactive programming. And um, th this might be something that is pretty like unfamiliar to uh, a lot of people who come from a like imperative programming background, which is typically the case on mobile, Android included, uh, being written in Java. Um, so I actually want to postpone this a little bit um, uh, and explaining what it is by first like motivating this uh, with like kind of like a background story. I want to say. Now, you know, SoundCloud is kind of like a traditional startup almost, I want to say, because, I mean, we're five years old now, so we have, like, grown. Um, but I, this is the second startup I've worked in, and um, I always, like, my experience always was that in, in startups, uh, you have this kind of pivot point at some point um, where you, where if the, pro if the product is successful, it kind of um, grows ahead of you a little bit. So at, you, at some point you realize, wow, this is, this is like turning into a success story. It's pretty, it's pretty big now. And... Um, if you've used a, a product before, uh, you know we, you know people use it to listen to music, listen listen to sounds, but also to share it with other people. So it's like a collaborative uh, experience between users. And um, yeah, we get a lot of usage on our Android uh, application as well. And um, yeah, when I when I first like joined uh, about a year ago, it's not about about a year ago. Um, yeah, it was pretty much like a typical um, scenario. There was like a, there was a rather big product with a lot of users, uh, a lot of traction. Everything was moving very quickly, and but you could also tell, you know, like by by looking uh, uh, at the uh, at the existing application, you, you could see like things were starting to crack a little bit. And um, so my my first project actually was. Um, to work on this particular screen in our application. So I, I've, I, if you've used the app before, uh, I, I just said you can use it to listen to music, for instance. And a very typical use case is to um, you know, take a bunch of uh, tracks and put them into a playlist. So this was a, f this is a pretty standard feature, right? You get this on all the audio platforms that you uh, may be familiar with. And um, it's a pretty simple screen. So you can, you can give uh, a playlist like a name. It could be an album, for instance, summarizing uh, a couple tracks. And you get them in a list, and you can listen to them in like this particular order. So, yeah, you would think that this is a pretty straightforward thing to build, right? And even on an existing code base. Um, however, when I was faced with this task, it turned out to be a bit more daunting than what, uh, what I was hoping for. So, when I started working on this on this screen, uh, I it came out as something that I was really not happy with. And pretty much what I was looking at was this. Um, I kind of, on this screen, there's a lot of, like, concurrency involved. You know, uh, think about things like uh, we sync data to the application, so it, not, not every single time you open a playlist in our application, we jump off to the API and make a request and see what's in there, right? You, don't, you really only want to make this when it changes, so you want to react to these changes. Uh, so we had a, a background syncing component, uh, which would make sure that occasionally... Uh, we update playlists uh, to your local device so that you actually just have to look at your local storage on the on on the uh, on the client and see what's there. Um, however, you know these things are asynchronous; they can happen in the background and then update your data, so which can suddenly result in sudden changes to the user interface, even when you're looking at it. Um, there was also things involved like um, pull to refresh. So if you want to. You know, we want to force refresh like playlist you're looking at, maybe because you change it on the website and you want to see this ref refresh immediately in the client, you could pull the refresh. Uh, we had to deal with uh, things such as, imagine you play back one of these tracks. Uh, we have this little highlight that we move over the individual items um, to, um, well, just to show that this track is currently playing. So, yeah, I guess, it, you know, wh when I looked at this code base and... Uh, particularly the screen and how, how it was built, there were so many different ways of how these events could arrive uh, in the user interface. It, I, it was very difficult to understand. It's, it's basically like trying to make a conversation when six people are shouting at you at the same time, right? It's like events coming in from all different directions, from different channels, and uh, it was hard to understand and uh, to, to deal with this stuff. So basically, 
I uh, tried to sit down and said, okay, I want to, I take a piece of paper and a pen and I kind of sketch what's going on here and see how events propagate through our backend and into this user interface. And I failed. I couldn't make it work. Like I went into like cycles uh, in the event flow and stuff. It was pretty ugly. Um, and I guess um, you know, mentioning this pivot point for, for me, this was kind of the point where I said, you know, there's something more fundamentally like broken in our application that we have to maybe revisit. And this kind of turned into a bit of a pattern um, where I noticed that we did a lot of things like which I don't consider like good practice, which is you know you are familiar with async task and how you can use it for background jobs. Um, so oftentimes you need to connect two different tasks because maybe the second one relies on the outcome of the first task. Um, so there's no obvious way really in doing this. So you kind of start nesting them, which is not so nice because then you end up with like callbacks within callbacks within callbacks and stuff. So um, yeah, the proverbial callback hell that you really try to avoid. Um, uh, often we would just, um, you know, we had to like do an API call, maybe just like go to local storage, which is not like super slow, but it's still um, IO. So you want to do it on a background thread. And since there was no obvious way in the code base um, to do this, there was no infrastructure in place to make this easy and simple, um, people would just like uh, just do it like on the main UI thread, which is a terrible practice, or just forget you know uh, putting it like in a background object. Mm. So this was not nice. Uh, also, we had like tons of custom callbacks that we would use throughout the app to propagate change events basically through the app. So it was pretty fragmented. Um, and so I, I just thought you, we, we can, you know, we, we want a stable application and a stable application re requires you to understand what it does first, right? Um, and in order to like not let this proliferate further, I just said, guys, let's, let's, let's just put our heads together and, and see how we can, can fix this and uh, find something uh, which really um, helps us expressing concurrency and event propagation in the application in a, in a much more streamlined way and not like in six different ways. I just want one way to deal with this. Uh, yeah, kind of like having a uniform event model in your application. And we didn't find this so much in the Android framework. So we kind of um, looked at different uh, approaches to this. And uh, luckily, um, a former coworker of mine, um, he, uh, um, at the same time, they had similar problems on iOS. And he was looking at a library called Reactive Coco, which is built by GitHub. And um, they implement, um, um, they are an implementation of the Reactive Extensions, which is um, a library that was first built for, for Windows Phone. Um, on the .NET platform, and I re when he explained to me how it works, I really liked it immediately. I, I thought this is this is the way I want to um, handle events in, my, in our application, because it sounds very very powerful. And um, so the first thing I did is just like Google um, reactive extensions for Java, and what I found was um, actually a port for Java, which is um, courtesy of uh, Netflix. They actually use this um, throughout um, their um, throughout their stack, like even the back end. So that being said. This is the tagline of the, of the project. Um, they say, RxJava is an implementation of doing functional reactive programming uh, on the Java virtual machine, and including Delhi, by the way. This is not just limited to hotspot. So there's this term again, functional reactive programming. So um, yeah, I, I told you I'm going to come back to this. So I kind of want to motivate a little bit now after like showing you what our problems were, um, how I think this solves this in a pretty nice way. And I have to kind of step it uh, step back like pretty pretty far for this to do I, I think so and I have like this super simple application which I think actually demonstrates the key problem pretty well that you usually have uh, when you write um, applications that contain uh, a lot of asynchronous operation operations so in in an imperative programming language like this is like the most like common way of expressing uh, progress throughout your app, I would say. You start with some kind of value, like x in this case, you give it, inside it to like some initial value, say one, and then you have a second value which depends on it, right? So, so y in this case depends on x, so it uh, adds just one to it. So, and then the third step, uh, we modify uh, the initial value and assign it to a new value now. Now it's two. So if I execute this application, the result is going to be two. And this might seem pretty straightforward if you're like used to imperative programming, but like any mathematician would tell you this application is wrong. Like this, this, this code that does not the right thing. And the reason for this is simply, if you look at line two again and kind of try to forget like what you're used to with imperative programming, just putting your program you know, step by step through computations, what you say here is that y is expressed in terms of x. 
So I want y to always be x plus 1, regardless of what x is. x is a variable, right? But this program doesn't do that. So if I execute it, uh, if x changes, this change is not reflected in the variable y here. Uh, so in all, I would have to always make a correction. I would always have to look at x again and then assign y to the now appropriate value. So this is actually not a correct program. Um, and functional reactive program prim programming can solve this um, problem for you. And we can rewrite it uh, simply using functions, like you know the most natural way like that we have in programming since ages, since the 50s. So uh, what we can do instead of like making y like a, a, a value at a specific point in time, we can um, express it using a lazy binding, basically, so, which is just a function. It can just be a function. So what we can do, for instance, is we can turn y into a function that now um, depends on x properly by, by closing over x. So basically, every single time we look at y, we automatically look, look at x again and uh, evaluate it to the latest value that it carries. So if I now execute this program, it doesn't matter what x is, like y will always reflect the, the latest uh, state. So um, now you pr probably ask, like, um, so, you know, how, how, how does this all fit together? So I, this is kind of pretty simplified, but I think of it, if you, if you, if you start with imperative programming in a way, and you add this, these dimensions of um, declarativity and lazy evaluation to it, uh, you kind of automatically arrive at what's reactive programming, basically. Um, in, if you, in reactive programming, you can implement this in a number of ways, and a very common way is to do this using uh, functional programming paradigms. And so if we add higher order functions to, to this mix, we kind of get um, functional reactive programming. So that's kind of the way I like to look at it. Okay, so this maybe, so if you say now, okay, this sounds all like a bit academic, then and what the hell, you know, does this have to do with mobile applications? That's a fair question. And um, especially if you're pulling in a new library into a pretty grown application, you have to have a good reason, you know, why you want to do this. You want to throw everything overboard and jump into something completely different. And I, I think the these two effects summarize this pretty well, why, why this is useful. Um, if you think about building mobile applications or, or even desktop applications, like anything that re, um, re responds to user input, um, these applications are reactive by, by nature. I mean, you, you click on a button and you expect something to happen and usually you expect the state to be reflected back into the user interface. This could be like you know changing the toggle state of a button or it, it could be showing a progress banner. There's always be uh, you want your apps to be responsive, right? There should always be something happening in, in return of the, this user interaction. Um, and the second uh, part is we are moving away from like just s storing data locally, right? You can, f caching is a different thing, but uh, like eventually all the data already is, is on the web. So you constantly have to jump off the main UI thread and kind of fetch data from, from, from some kind of service API. It's just such a common use case. And... Um, so just to, to close the loop here, I, I just think um, the, the current APIs that we get for writing such applications, and that includes Android and iOS as well, um, they are just they don't cope with this. They don't give us the right tools, basically, to write um, to express this in an easy and straightforward way in your application. Um, so what I would like to have, so this is more like a like a wish list for me as a d developer. If I if I if I look at like Android, for instance. I want to have APIs which are um, which expect asynchronous basically di by default. Like this whole thing about being declarative and describing the task rather than executing it now and here. Uh, I want this to be reflected in the programming APIs that I, I use. And Martin Odersky, the founder of the Scala language, he calls this the ask to construct principle, which is a bit in, in uh, as opposed to uh, the tell don't ask principle. So where I have to constantly like uh, tell some collaborator object, do this now, do that now, and give me the return value, and I kind of have to manually put put it all together. And um, what I would also like to have is this continuous flow of change over time. You know, if if you look at events, there's not there's never going to be just one tap in your application. There's never going to be just one item returned for your API. It's always like a sequence if you think about it, right? And often these connect to each other. So I want to kind of model events in, in exactly that way because that's how uh, like data flows through your app at the end of the day. And the third point is like may maybe even the most important one is um, jumping to the UP API, for instance, making network requests, going to local storage, all the stuff that's expensive usually is also extremely prone to failure. Right? If, if, I, if I'm outside on like a not so great data connection, uh, things are definitely going to fail. And I, I want to support, I want to have like first class support in my programming APIs 
uh, that make it clear how to deal with failure in the application and make it simple to work with. So, you know, if we like look at what Android gives us for this right right now, um, uh, I mean, the first thing I already mentioned that comes to mind is async task. And I've been a long time opponent of async task. <laughs> Basically, ever since it's been around, I tried to work around it, write my own extensions to it and stuff, but it never felt right. And I think what, the reason why it doesn't feel right is um, there's like very subtle caveats with it. Uh, one being that the con concurrency strategies change <coughs> like three times or so over the lifetime of Android. Uh, it used to be like an unbounded thread pool, I think, or a very like highly capped thread pool. Um, and these days, I'm not even sure if everyone is aware of this. I think with ICS forward, a every async task is a single threaded um, executor service. So whatever you stick in your a any async task anywhere in your application, regardless of what it does, it's going to end up in a queue that runs on a single thread. So it's, it runs concurrently to your main user interface, but it runs serially. So let's say you have an API call that blocks for five seconds. If you schedule um, a, a database operation, which is much faster usually, using async task, it's going to land in the same single threaded executor. So it, it's going to wait five seconds to execute, which is terrible. Um, internally, it uses um, futures and handlers, which are pretty low level. So usually as a developer, I don't really want to care about the low level stuff. And you might also be familiar with the context problem that uh, in on post execute and on async task, you want to update the UI usually because you want to say, like, you know, give feedback to the user that the task finished or whatever. And you can't really do this out of the box because there's no context reference in, in the callbacks and async tests. So you ha have to handle them yourself and you have to make sure they don't leak, right? If you, if you go through a configuration change and your task is still running, you need to make sure to release these references. Otherwise, you're going to leak a reference to your entire screen, which is not great. There's no error handling built in, which is pretty amazing considering that it uses futures internally, which have error handling built in. So Google managed to completely conceal that from you, which I have no idea why they did this. Um, and they're not composable, like what I said before. If you have a, a task that depends on a different task, uh, it becomes like uh, really difficult to um, put them together. So yeah, like looking at RxJava, um, let's see like how what we can do to to fix all this. Um, RxJava basically models um, your your jobs. I want to say that you want to execute as something that it calls observable sequences. So I already like hinted at this that. Uh, it looks at data being propagated as sequences um, throughout the application. And this is, this is pretty much just, you can just think of an obser observable as kind of an asynchronous push-based collection, a push-based Java collection, basically. And the way it works is um, there's a couple of um, factory methods that the framework gives you to create them. And what usually happens is uh, you create a, a block, which is just a function, which takes a listener object that um, uh, RxJava calls an observer. And whatever you do uh, in this block, uh, this is just a really simple example where we, um, where we have like, where we create a simple integer data source, right? It just emits um, val uh, integer values, but it could be as complicated as like fetching an API re response and emitting like maybe your uh, business objects from this uh, API response that you parse. And um, so what we do is in, in, in this task, we always have a reference to whoever listens uh, to this data. And what we do is for every item in the sequence that we have, uh, we push these values back into our listeners. And um, I think one key takeaway here is if you, if you look at these calls that are highlighted, uh, create and subscribe, um, so this all happens in a declarative fashion. So this call to create here takes this block. Uh, I, I, by the way, I used the Java 8 um, closure syntax here. If, the, you know, if you're not familiar with this, just think uh, of using anonymous classes in your standard, standard Java 5, Java 6. When you create listeners, you know, you just create the inline asynchronous class. That's the same thing. And um, so this create function just t returns a new object which describes my job, basically, that I want to perform. But it doesn't execute right away. So it only executes if I subscribe someone to this job who's interested in the result. So I can actually de decouple my job description from, uh, from whoever wants to listen to it, right, at maybe a later point in time. So if I call subscribe here uh, with an observer object, and we're going to look in a second at how that looks like, um, it's actually going to emit these integer values, one, two, three, that I generate in this loop here. So I mentioned observers. Um, uh, they are very, very simple, which, which is another thing I like. Um, event propagation in RxJava is done over just three uh, different notifications. They call it notifications, these callbacks, uh, which are on next, on completed, and on error. Um, and this is the same for any sequence you create, regardless of what data you transport through it. Um, so on next is pretty obvious. It just takes the next value in your sequence and pushes it 
or, or in this case, receives it in the in the observer. Um, so it can do whatever you want with it, right? You know, uh, maybe propagate it to the UI. Uh, you also get a signal uh, when the job is completed. So maybe if you want to do like cleanup work or whatever, that's a separate callback. And you have a third callback uh, if something goes wrong, like it just passes you uh, the passes the exception into your observer, and you can handle it. Maybe you know report it to Crashlytics or Bugsense or whatever ever you use. And yeah, so it's kind of simple to work with it because these uh, observers are just defined with these th uh, three methods. Um, so that's kind of the basic pattern, how you create your, your um, task and how you describe how this da data is propagated. And um, the nice thing about this is um, it gives us an interface to uh, um, introduce new steps in these com computations um, where we can transform data, for instance, um, because maybe my service API, whatever, or in this case, my integer sequence, whatever it might be, maybe it's not in the exact format that I require it to be in, in the user interface, right? This often happens, right? You make an API call, and then you think, oh, well, that's not exactly what I need. I actually want to need it in a slightly different structure. So then you only have two options, right? You, you adjust it on the client side, or you rewrite the backend to serve it in the correct format um, to you. And uh, RxJava has a very simple answer to this as well, which is borrowed also from the functional programming world, which is called map. It's just a function that you can um, invoke on any observable sequence because they all share the same interface. And, and you can pass a new function in there which tells you um, uh, what you want to do with the result that's passed into it. So in this example, um, I just like double the, the integer value that it's going to pass in from the serve source observable. So. So this object here is the observable I created on the, in the previous slides. So I invoke map uh, again with like a, a function using this. I just use the Java 8 closure syntax here again just for brevity. Uh, in your mind, you can explode this if you want into the uglier format than Java 5 employs. Uh, yeah, so I double res the result. And um, as, a, as, a, as, a, um, as the outcome of this, if I subscribe the same observer that we had on the previous slide, it's now going to receive this sequence instead which is the doubled uh, integer values. So I didn't have to change my observer at all. I didn't have to change my initial sequence at all. I just um, injected a new function, which does this trans transformation for me, um, which I can keep around separately. I can unit test it separately. And, um, and I can plug it all together into you know, like a new chain, new call chain, basically. Um, and I, of course, I mentioned concurrency before, and if you noticed on the previous slides, there was no concurrency involved at all. So um, uh, the, the beautiful thing about RxJava is that concurrency, again, is just treated as another transformation of your source sequence. So it just looks at, it doesn't treat concurrency specially in any way. It just says it's just like another uh, kind of um, behavior change, basically, in, in your sequence. So what you can do is I can take, again, the exact same observable that I had before, which is just a synchronous loop, right, if you remember it. And I can, uh, I can uh, invoke this method called subscribe on, um, which tells RxJava, I want to, um, I want to, as soon as this observer subscribes to my sequence, I want to actually execute this on a different thread. And there's a number of, like, pre-built schedulers that you can use, or you can also write your own, uh, for instance, like, executor services. One of the existing ones is new thread. So in this case, I could... Um, actually emit these integer values on the background thread by just passing in a subscribe on new thread. So it's just a single line of code. And um, in, uh, related to this, I can also um, transform my source sequence by uh, emitting the notifications on a different thread, which is different, right? Yeah, you can have the computation on one thread, but maybe you need the, um, uh, the notifications on a different thread, which is like exactly the super common use case that I mentioned in the beginning on Android where you do something on a background thread and you want to consume it on the main UI thread to update your views. Uh, so uh, this is the, a bit that we contributed back from SoundCloud. It's like an Android scheduler, and so you can tell your sequence, I want to observe it on the main UI thread. And uh, then again, at the end, I just subscribe the same observer, and then kind of magically it computes it in the background and sends it to me on the main UI thread. Like there's no like synchronization primitives involved that you have to write. So like this is all kind of uh, technical, I guess. So I always thought, what's like a good visual image to come up with to explain these things? Because it can be a bit daunting at first. And um, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure you're all familiar with dominoes, right? Like these little stones that you can put up and then you can flick them over. 
And in Germany, there's actually a contest around this called Domino Days, uh, where they form teams and they uh, build up these massive chains of dominoes that they arrange in like weird arrangements and contraptions. And then you start flicking over the first one, and it creates like this huge chain of uh, dominoes flipping over. Uh, and yeah, basically, uh, I think people vote at the end of the day who had like the coolest, the funniest uh, setup, and uh, then you win a prize. And I kind of look at observables as dominoes. So um, uh, look at if you start down here. Um, oh, sorry, if you start down here, this is kind of where the chain starts, right? So every domino is kind of a value that we emit through our sequence. So if I call subscribe, this triggers the sequence. And if the first one tips over, like I have all these on next calls in my observer, and they go through here, right? So these are all my on next calls. And maybe, you know, you see these three here, they kind of popped out because this broke. Uh, so in this case, I would invoke, or RxJava for me actually would invoke on error. It does it automatically. Like if anywhere an exception is thrown, it just propagates it to your observer through on error. You don't have to worry like, where it came from. Um, or if everything goes well, like I go all, all the way around here, and then maybe I want to apply a transformation, right? So I want to turn the color maybe here from black to red or vice versa, whatever. Uh, so that kind of corresponds to the map call that I showed you. So I take a single item and transform it into something new. Um, there's more complex oper operators as well that RxJava gives you. A very common one is called merge map, uh, which fans out uh, your values. Um, this is very powerful if you have like a, a single source sequence and you need uh, like n new sequences out of it. So they can, for every item, it commit an entire new sequence of new values. So this can be pretty powerful as well. Yeah, and when this is all done, at some point you get this call to uncompleted, and then, yeah, your uh, sequence is done, and you have all the values uh, emitted. So, um, of course, I want to turn this into something like more practical than just integer sequences as well. So I just thought I'd give you like a, just a rough idea of how we use it in our application, actually. Um, so uh, going forward, the, uh, this was kind of mid-last year, we decided it, to do it this way, basically. So for every new piece of functionality we add to our application, uh, we make sure that our <laughs> UI components, which usually are, are fragments of views, are extremely dumb. Like they know nothing. They just represent, they just visualize state, basically. Um, and so, yeah, they just like observe a source sequence, basically. And these source sequences that they observe um, are, in our case, RxJava observables. And we define them over some T, uh, which in our case is our business object. So it could be like, you know, on SoundCloud we have we work with track metadata a lot, so or it could be users, you know, that we fetch from the API. So we have observable of users, we have observables of tracks. Um, so all our application logic, um, like our service calls into our business logic, they return observable sequences. And um, then we, we wrote a bit, little bit of glue code as well that we found useful. Uh, like more recently, we actually um, implemented an event bus on, on RxJava, which we use especially for if you want to broadcast things. So if you, want to, if you have like a number of observers that are interested in some kind of event, you can publish to a queue, and it uses RxJava to fan out to a number of observers. And this is nice as well if you want to connect like a backend service, for instance, to a UI component. Uh, we use it for paging as well. If we have list paging, we have like a completely self-contained component that implements paging in a reactive way. Yeah, and built on top of this, like I just said, for instance, um, we have like this endless list adapter that's built using RxJava as well. So in the code, this would look something like this. And some things are almost taken verbatim out of our code base, actually. So, um, so it is actually quite, quite simple to write these calls. Um, so if we start with a fragment, in the fragment somewhere, we would typically, for instance, in onCreate, uh, or like maybe in the constructor, uh, we would construct uh, our observable sequence that we're interested in. So um, we would use uh, a, an operator that is now part of the um, library as well, uh, which can bind a sequence to our fragment. And it kind of gives you, uh, it deals with like context changes and stuff. So it makes sure that you don't leak a reference to uh, the UI component that's listening. And um, we base this off of the call into our business logic. So, so this is not an Android service. This would be like a, you know, if we th think of a layered architecture, it would more like be a business service, right? So, uh, so load tracks in this case would uh, return an observable to which we subscribe. And then whenever like data arrives, the fragment reacts to it. So if we look at the service object then, uh, in this load tracks method here, which, is, which I did simplify a little bit, but this is roughly how it would look like. Uh, I told you, so this returns an observable sequence of tracks. And uh, what it does is it hides all the information from the uh, UI, which the UI sh really shouldn't be aware of, which is things like, where does this data come from? Like the UI doesn't care if it comes from the API or if it comes from local storage or if it's generated synchronously. Uh, it should be, so it's just like we uh, try to practice like information hiding here. And uh, so we construct, for instance, an API request uh, 
and we have a HTTP client built on top of RxJava as well, which um, uh, models API responses in, in terms of observable sequences as well. And so, yeah, uh, in, in this case, we just pass on this request that we built and pass it down to the HTTP client. So if you look at this guy, um, so this guy has, for instance, a, a method to fetch model objects from our API. So it takes this request that we just created, and um, it then performs. So this, again, is like an observable sequence. <coughs> and uh, what it does is it will actually execute the request and send it to the API. And it will do so automatically on a, on a specified um, a scheduler, which we use purely for API requests. So we make sure that we never congest on it, because maybe we we'll want to go to local storage so that it's not blocked. You know? uh, and then this is all declarative, right? So this doesn't happen right here. I, I'm still in the construction phase of constructing my sequence, basically. So, uh, so if I have like this like future to be response, I can use merge map as I showed earlier, and take this response and create a new sequence from it. So in this case, what like a very common case, I'm sure you've all done it before, is you take, for instance, a JSON object, uh, uh, yeah, JSON res response or, or XML or whatever you might be using protobuf, and you convert it into a, a first class object in Java, right? That you use like a, like a business object in your in your in your code. So we can then map over this um, response object, apply a transformation, which in this case is just it parses it, like we use checksum to just parse it into a model object, uh, and then return this as a new sequence. So it's all in a declarative fashion. And as soon as you subscribe to it, you get these little dominoes that you know tip over and execute each step, um, as per the rules that you define here. So yeah, if we look at this. Um, I think it's kind of uh, it might be it might be if, if you're not familiar with this kind of style it might be uh, difficult to get at first but it's actually quite beautiful because it's very simple actually if you think about it we have just like our entire like event model is just built around three notifications so there can be any number of on next calls like zero or however many and then there's either one call to uncompleted which means your sequence terminates successfully um, so you can show like some happy face to the user in your application. Or, um, or it terminates in on error, so then you can switch your UI into some kind of error state. Um, it's also uh, uh, reusable because uh, since every single step that you define um, is like a separate function, and since the function in Java 6 is just like a, a class that implements a function interface, right? I mean, we're still in the Java world. Uh, you can actually unit test them separately. And uh, it's great for composition because uh, you can write it once and apply it to different sequences. You can, it's just a whole new way of code reuse that doesn't in, in involve just the typical object-oriented style. And this is a very, very common thing to, if you worked with functional languages before, that's a super common thing to do in, in like Scala, for instance, or Haskell. Um, it's actually also, uh, once you get the hang of it, I should say, it's actually quite simple to test because um, uh, RxJava gives you a couple um, helpers already um, to write unit tests where you can have um, observable set always em emit a specific like mock item, for instance, um, or always terminate an error. So it's actually quite easy to write a test uh, where you say, I want to test that my fragment, whenever the observable fails, I want it to show an error dialog or something. That's actually very simple to do here, because in your unit test, you would just swap out your real implementation of the observable sequence with one that always emits an error. And there's already, already helpers for this in, in the library that you can use for this. And um, also, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you use RoboElectric, I guess, for testing, uh, which kind of mocks out the entire networking layer for you. Um, and I'm not actually a big fan of this because it kind of encourages you to write integration tests when you should write unit tests. Um, so uh, one thing that's cool about this as well is that since concurrency is parameterized, I simply don't put it on a background thread in a unit test, right? It's just another call like that I do to my observable. So if I only if I make sure that I only actually do this in in the production code in the in the, in the fragment, for instance, uh, then I don't have to worry about it uh, in, in the unit <laughs> test. So like you, you can tell, like I'm pretty excited about this stuff, and I, I really really like it. Um, so you could ask, you know, should we all switch to reactive programming now? And I think the answer is clearly no. Um, <laughs> It's just that um, there's downsides to this as well. And you have to kind of make a decision yourself whether it makes sense to you or not. So I, I think um, a pretty obvious thing is a lot of people will you know, um, be offended by the uh, anonymous class syntax that you have to use a lot because you define your funct functions in terms of um, anonymous classes. But then again, you have to do this with listeners a lot as well, right? If you register a listener like in a view, uh, you always, you know, these are interfaces that you implement, so you often have these inline 
new something something listener that that creates an anonymous function for you as well. Like, it's kind of the same thing. Um, also, like uh, <laughs> one thing also you will notice during debugging is you can get a pretty deep call stack. So uh, since you have all these transformations, you can have like uh, tons of unnext calls being nested. So um, something to keep an eye on. And um, it will also definitely create more objects for you. And since you use a lot of anonymous classes, you will have more classes in your code. So uh, that's so you should keep an eye on on, on, on GC activity. Um, on the good, on the bright side, however, like we have we have had this in production since like summer last year or so, and um, yeah, I don't know, I, especially in terms of performance, like it's we haven't found like a major roadblock in this, so I'm actually pretty confident that this is good enough for production. Um, I think one of the major points, though, is even if you can live with all these things, is, is maybe the learning curve. And I think this is the this is kind of a decision that you have to make on a team or like company basis, even um, because. For us, it make a lo makes a lot of sense because on iOS uh, we use uh, a different library, but it uses exactly the same um, exactly the same patterns, and um, so we we can have knowledge exchange between the teams around these um, patterns as well, right? Uh, so like we we actually benefit from using this uh, uh, across the company, and also in the backend software that we build, um, we use different libraries as well. Like in, we're building our own mobile service API now. And it's based on the Twitter stack, what they use, and it's based on Scala and Finagle. And they and Finagle is actually very, very similar to RxJava. It, it's, it, it doesn't model these things as sequences, but it uh, takes the whole reactive idea um, as well. Um, that being said, by the way, um, this is definitely something that uh, it is, is going to come in some way, shape, or form, because uh, just two weeks ago, Spotify released their own reactive framework called Trickle. So if you want to have a look at this, and I noticed that um, Parse, they, they were acquired by Facebook. They have a framework called Bolts, and they built their stuff on, on Bolts, which is, and I looked at it, and it's like, it's very similar. It's like, they all use the same ideas uh, and underlying um, these things. So um, we're pr still a pretty small team, but I think it's a pretty exciting time. So we're still looking like, so if you want to work on like crazy things like this. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so we're always like open like, for joiners. And uh, I have a couple like references here that I want to leave up uh, during questions, maybe. Um, I wrote a little bit uh, on, about this on my blog as well. So if you just go to the main site, maybe. Uh, I think there are three, uh, three posts or something around this stuff. We want to read up on it. And all these things also kind of for, for the background behind it, like the key ideas, maybe, again, if you're interested in that. Yeah, that, that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I, I think we have like five minutes for questions. Uh, how do you know that a uh, fragment is being destroyed and you should free the reference to the observable callback? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, we don't know that the fragment is destroyed, but um, uh, I actually le uh, left out a, like a tiny detail uh, when I showed you the... Um, let me, let me actually go back to this uh, slide for this question because it's a very interesting point, and I can tell you how we solved it. Um, sorry. Um, this guy. So on this slide, what you actually do uh, in this function here, you always have to return uh, here, where I call uncompleted. After I'm done with this, I actually have to return what RxJava calls a subscription. Uh, a subscription is an object that the caller can hold on to, and it has just a single method called um, unsubscribe. <laughs> and so what you have to do is, in, in your fragment and undestroy, you would, you, you would hold on to the subscription, and in undestroy you call unsubscribe. And I showed you this from fragment call before. That's the operator that we use for the UI stuff. Um, it makes sure that if you call unsubscribe, it will release all the references to the fragment. So this is something that you still have to do. It's not aut automatically. And I actually played with doing it automatically using weak references and stuff, but it was, it was not as, actually uh, not as nice because um, it becomes really indeterministic. And uh, I really prefer to be explicit about this stuff. Yeah. Oh, okay, thanks. You're welcome. Two questions. The first one, if um, w we can model a, a state machine with uh, RxJava, and how is it easy to do it? And uh, the second is the relationship uh, between the fragments and the activity life cycles, in particular uh, with um, instant save, um, instant state savement, uh, saving, oh, okay. sorry. 
Uh, okay, so the first one, uh, whether it's easy to um, create a state machine. I think I think of um, observable sequences more as like data pipelines. So I, I think of it more like like an assembly line where you put like data through and transform it bit by bit. So in that sense, in that sense, it's actually the opposite of a state machine because it actually tries to re remove state, right? Because it only only ever looks like at what do I have in a single step and how do I get to the next step, right? So if you um, if you want to uh, I don't know, like maybe if you're, if you're interested, I mean, if you only had like a final outcome state. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know, maybe it's an interesting idea. I haven't really thought about it too much, but um, maybe something to explore. I, 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 th I think it doesn't like lend itself naturally to, to state machines, but it could, could be possible. Actually, um, I saw a post by Jake Wharton, uh, uh, like they kind of went in a similar direction uh, on the mailing list. Maybe have a look at this, because he tried to uh, use RxJava for some kind of... Um, uh, data processing, which I, I, I presume in, in, in involved like states that you had to transform, so that you get like a pipeline out of it, basically. Yeah. So, what was the second question? Right. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, which relationship does the sequence have with the activity life cycle? Um, so, that really depends on the case. So, there's like no generic answer to this. But I, I think a very common case is that you're not interested in the sequence anymore if your fragment disappears, right? Because uh, usually, uh, let, let's say I s show a search result on a screen, right? Then, as, if the user backs out of the screen, uh, there's no reason really uh, why I should continue to keep this in memory, uh, except maybe for caching reasons. Um, so usually uh, we, we bind them to the fragment or activity li life cycle. So um, that's kind of ties in with, with your question before. So if you go through an activity on destroy or if you go through a fragment on destroy, we unsubscribe. And um, the, the second, there's a second part to this question, I think, which is around instant state. Uh, because and this is very important if you go through a configuration change, right? Because then, then the user is actually still interested in the screen, obviously, right? But you do go through on destroy. And um, RxJava actually helps you here by having a bunch of um, operators that are part of the standard library, which can um, cache <coughs> values for you and replay them. So uh, if, I, uh, if I go through a configuration change and I resubscribe to a sequence, which I transformed using the replay operator, it will um, pick up any new elements that are still coming in and just forward them. But all the items that had already been emitted are just replayed on the observer which is great because then, you, again, you don't need to keep state in the fragment. You just get uh, emitted again what was already in the sequence. Um, how long did it take to implement RxJava in the SoundCloud application? Uh, that, that's still an ongoing thing. So we're kind of gradually introducing it. So we didn't like, we, we really like, this is a general thing we do. We don't just like, throw everything out of the window and like, start from scratch because that is, that is dangerous as well. <laughs> uh, so uh, the way we started is, is by what we call feature greenfielding. So whenever we, bought, uh, whenever we um, uh, build something new, like a new piece of functionality, uh, we build it in the way, uh, so and if we're not happy with the existing infrastructure that would support this, um, we build it in, in exactly the same way we think it should work and build it like, uh, as part of the code base, but whatever doesn't exist yet, we just write it from scratch for to support this. And then we um, keep doing this and as when we add new features, uh, so, so to grow it like organically uh, in a way. So this is how we introduced um, Rx. And, and it's working. I, I mean, it's like a slow process, obviously, and it's a big app. But um, yeah, we're, we're totally getting there. Like it's been, I think, nine or 10 months now. And uh, yeah, we have, like, we have a lot of functionality based on Rx already in the application. Uh, just another quick, quick question. Uh, in that example that you were observing on the separated threads, in fact, uh, this observe on method takes executor or thread? Oh, okay. It takes um, a scheduler. So uh, uh, Java uh, has a custom class. It calls a scheduler. And a scheduler is, again, a very, they, they really focus on having very simple, easy to understand interfaces. So a scheduler has just a single method called schedule. And what you tell the scheduler what it does, and but it supplies a few default schedulers for you, and um, a few of the default schedulers are uh, executed services uh, which are bounded or unbounded, basically based on what you want to do. So we use, for instance, a bounded uh, uh, scheduler for API requests, so that we don't create like 20 different threads, but we use an unbounded scheduler for storage, uh, uh, disk I/O, and um, yeah, you can also use a scheduler, uh, of course, for Android-specific. 
uh, tasks, which involves the message loop that Android uh, maintains internally. And this is the bit that we've wrote, basically. So we, uh, we, so this Android schedule submain thread it returns um, a scheduler that we wrote, which will um, use Android's message loop system uh, to um, uh, forward notifications, like uh, notifications on next, on completed, and so forth. It will forward it uh, through the message loop in Android so that we'll receive it on the main UI thread. Okay, thanks. Hi. Um, one of the drawbacks uh, I Sorry, found... Sorry, I don't see you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm here, yeah. Uh, one of the drawbacks I found implementing in Reactive Cocoa this design pattern was that I, I couldn't address my user interface with outlet anymore because the RAC signals, it was just a, a code implemented interface. Does this apply as well in Android platform or can I address my user interface as I am I supposed to do in the user way, I mean? Uh, you, you mean you want to reference so that you can update the user interface? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so this is not part of the core libraries uh, because um, you know, like Reactive Cocoa as well uh, was built uh, cross-platform. So they actually built for the Mac client. They didn't build it for iOS. They built it for the Mac client. Um, so this would always be like specific to the platform, right? Because Android has its own user interface framework. And um, so th I can tell you the way we do it is um, using this um, from fragment operator, which internally basically just do, does this. It schedules on the main UI thread for you, but it also keeps a reference to the view, right? Okay. So, so that uh, in whatever you do in your transformation, you actually have a reference to it. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>